Right, today we're doing another roundtable. We have, uh, well, eventually we'll have three guests with us, joining us here. But right now we're going to kick things off with uh, two who's done, uh, of course, research on uh, lost races, human origins, uh, DNA, and the uh, mysterious past of uh, where the human being is coming from. We have Lloyd Pye and Brian Forster with us. Uh, is going to join us here in the first segment, and, and then we have Jerry Willis that's going to join us in the second uh, as well. Well, first of all, we can say welcome back to Lloyd Pye. Uh, thanks for coming on. It was a while ago now, or maybe a year ago, maybe a little bit more, but nonetheless, it's uh, good to have you back, Lloyd. So thanks for coming on. Thank you, and it is good to be back, and it's probably been at least a year, I would imagine. So, yes, happy to be here. I think so. Time does fly indeed. And uh, then we have Brian Forrester with us. Uh, not too long ago, we talked, of course, about uh, the recent Egypt tour you guys did. I, I heard things turned out great with a lot of uh, new experiences, new insights, and some uh, new friends as well. So good to have you back so soon, Brian. Oh, thank you very much, Henrik. So why don't we just begin to you know, talk a little bit about you guys' collaboration work here. I mean, you both have been interested in... Uh, anomalous skulls, pretty much. Elongated skulls. Uh, we have the star child skull uh, from Lloyd Pye and everything else. Um, Lloyd, maybe you can just describe a little bit where you guys' work meet and how long you've been working together, kind of behind the scenes, uh, so I hear anyway. Well, it's been it's been probably, what, two years, I would imagine, Brian, at least that. Maybe yeah. three. Um, maybe three, I don't know, somewhere in there. And when I, real, when I personally have always been interested in the Coneheads, and I've been saying in lectures for probably close to 15 years now that the Coneheads are as important in their own way as the Star Child Skull. Even though the Star Child Skull is one of a kind so far, and the Coneheads are in the hundreds, that doesn't mean that they aren't in very, very important in their own way. And I kept saying, somebody needs to do something with those things. They, as far as I knew, they had not even been... Um, carbon carbon dated, uh, much less have their you know their DNA analyzed in any way. So I kept harping about that, and I kept saying if if I ever got any money from the Star Child, that was the next thing I was going to turn my attention to. And then I heard about Brian being down there, and I I we connected, and I started saying you know you ought to be, become the conehead guy, <laughs> you know. It, it, no, there's nobody there to fill that role right now. It could be you. It should be you. And so um, I, he acted on that, and, and, you know, he's become the Conehead guy. So, not, I mean, not that that's the only thing that he does, but I, I think it was uh, he, he filled a, a role that was very much needed in the field of alternative knowledge, and I think he's done a really good job with it. Very good. So what, what's, what is the relationship between the two uh Brian, how much similarities are we talking about? Have you seen uh, the, the Star Child Skull as well? No, but I'm, actually I'm hoping that uh, Lloyd will at least bring a, a, a copy of the, or the Star Child with him when he comes in August. But uh, I think the, the parallel between the two is the fact that mainstream science has a tendency not to want to look at either. And so Lloyd has been very, um, you know, he's been working very hard with uh, the one specimen that he does have, and I've been very fortunate with the multiple examples of the elongated skulls of Peru and Bolivia that I've been able to uh, study very close up and literally hands-on. So that's why it's wonderful that Lloyd will be able to come down to Peru in August, and, and uh, he'll get a, an opportunity also to look at these very much um, he'll be able to handle them, etc. And because he has great knowledge of human anatomy, uh, human origins, um, the primates, etc., his input will be very important for the study of the elongated skulls of Peru. Indeed. So a lot of this has to do with human origins. I mean, that's that's one of the biggest uh, uh, questions that we're that we're faced with. Obviously, the, the differences of the human being and where we. Uh, come from and everything else. Is there anything with these different skulls that can actually give us some clues about this, uh, Lloyd? Elongated or the star child? Yeah, I think I think very much so, and that's one of the one of the th things we're trying to do with the, the DNA research on both. It's clear to me that the coneheads are not entirely human. Some aspect of them, some part of them, is human-like. It's very fair to say that the conehead skulls are human-like whereas the star child is not human-like. There's no single part of the star child that you can look at, the star child skull, and find an exact corollary on a human skull. Every 
single thing that you can name as a major. The tw there are 25 major differences and several minor differences between the star child and a human, and there's not a single corollary. Whereas with the coneheads, you do have corollaries. You also have radical differences. So those radical differences, to me, indicate that the, the coneheads will prove to be not entirely human, and their DNA, I think, will prove that as well. So what, what we'll be looking at is a, a culture that was on the earth and, and widespread all over the place at one point that wasn't us, that wasn't entirely us. Who were they? What were they about? What were they doing? And that will open up when we get it established, when we, as Brian was saying, science is very unwilling to deal with these kinds of things because it means changing so much of their fundamental belief set. And when they are forced to do it, when they have absolutely no choice, when everybody understands that these things are real and they have to be dealt with, when it's safe for them to do it and they put their minds to it and their best minds to it, they will come up with some very, very good answers, I think, that will begin to explain who and what those beings really were. There are tons of different types of uh, humans and, and uh, primates and then the, the in-betweens that have existed, uh, come, and, come and gone pretty much on, on the planet. And, and uh, I want to try to get a little closer to a suggested time frame here, Lloyd, and when you think that uh, you know, either of these species that we're talking about or, you know, how different they are, if there are a different species or race or whatever we classify them as, as uh, approximately where we should put them in, in the timeline, timeline, if we can do such a thing. Well, we've, we've carbon dated four uh, samples that, that Brian sent, and those four samples were between 2100 and 2300 uh, years ago. So that, he says, fits right in with the, the dating of the Paracas culture. So we have at least that much for them. But that doesn't mean that if you were to carbon-14 a bunch of other specimens, say from Malta or from Egypt or somewhere else in the world that they're found, that you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get different dates and you wouldn't get dates that go significantly farther back. So um, we, those are, that's all work that needs to be done. I mean, we, could, we should carbon date samples from wherever they're found and see when they come in because that's going to help in the shaping of the story of who they were and where they might have come from and where they might have gone. Yeah, that's right. Um, where are we with, with the DNA testing, Brian? You, you mentioned you guys are working on some of this and if that is the ultimate, uh, uh, I guess, key to, to unlock the mystery, do you think? Well, it's a major point. Um, Lloyd's geneticist uh, who's been studying the star child has samples. Also, uh, Dr. Melba Ketchum in Texas uh, has a number of samples. There's also uh, a lab that recently received samples in Los Angeles, and they've, uh, they've so far been studying the hair and have found out uh, quite definitively that the reddish hair of the uh, noble Paracas elongated skull people is natural red hair. It's not dyed. It's not... Uh, the result of aging or oxidation. So that's an important point. And then after the August uh, tour that uh, Lloyd and I will do, there'll be a fourth team that will be studying the DNA of the Paracas and uh, possibly Bolivian skulls. And so that's great because if you have four separate teams uh, working on more or less samples from the same area, then that's very good science. What do you guys make of uh, Ketchum's results? Because we're as far as I'm, I remember, she's just pretty much detailing this as, as Bigfoot uh, DNA, right, Brian? Well, she's, actually, she has been studying Bigfoot DNA for, I think, five or six years. And it's not something that she's really been doing that publicly. She, actually, she would like to get the results. Um, well, she's published them, but she would like to honestly leave the topic because she is a veterinarian, first and foremost, uh, she got into the subject of Bigfoot just out of curiosity and spent five very exhaustive years. But the trouble with, uh, or the problem that Melba's had is that she's been attacked bitterly and, and viciously by different uh, camps studying Bigfoot. Uh, some believe that the Bigfoot is totally ape. 
Some believe it's totally human, and she's found through exhaustive DNA studies that it's somewhere in between. So, um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of bad press about Melba. I'm in quite constant contact with her, and I find her to be a very genuine human being. Yeah, we should we should have an, her on if she's still interested in talking about this, of course, because it's very very interesting. What what do you make of it, uh, Lloyd? Considering your background and all this. Well, one of the problems our geneticist has, and and he's a a long time. Uh, virologist, biologist, geneticist. So he's been working in the field of genetic analysis for the the major part of his career. And what he's found with the star child and also uh, with the with the coneheads is that they are so different from what he recovers, and it's only partial recoveries. We all should understand he does not. We have not been able to give him the money to do the kinds of testing that needs to be done that the mainstream does on the Neanderthal, let's say, or on Denisova. They can throw millions of grant money, millions of dollars of grant money at any problem that they want an answer for. And they could do it for these things too if they wanted an answer, but they don't. Yeah. So it's our responsibility to get those millions of dollars from people to do the work that needs to be done. But over time, our geneticist has carefully chipped away as best he could out of his own pocket, using his own time, his own free time on weekends, to do an amazing amount of, of recovery. We're uh, of a genome now, you have probably three, in the range of three billion for the star child, and I would imagine coneheads will be the same way. Humans are around three billion. The Neanderthals are Denisova, gorilla chimps. So let's just say three billion. Um, our guy is his uh, partial recovery over two hundred million, over two hundred million base pairs now. Hmm. And it consistently comes up that it's not matching anywhere near the ballpark of human. The problem is, and it's the same with the coneheads. There's it requires new algorithms for the sequencing, the, for the computers to do the analysis because they've never seen it before. Now, remember that there was a time when the human genome had never been seen before, when the Neanderthal genome had never been seen before. It isn't that this can't be done, that the new algorithms can't be created for DNA that isn't found basically on Earth, that, that has just never been seen before. But it requires a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of manpower, a lot of specialized manpower, and of course the money to pay for all that. The answer is out there. The answer is recoverable. It just takes the money to do it. When And those new algorithms will be created, and they can be created, but I would suspect that the algorithms for the star child will be as radically different from human as they are from the coneheads, and the conehead algorithms will be less radically different, but still markedly different from the human al algorithms and the Neanderthal algorithms that have been created and the Denisova. We can't know, of course, what we're going to find until we, we do the work on it or until you guys do the work on it actually finds this. But at this point, is there any speculation as to the relationship to, to us humans? I mean, if we look at the Neanderthal uh, human relationship, we know that there was, uh, you know, uh, inbreeding, things like this going on. There are suggestions that they are, uh, you know, or crossbreeding rather, you know, between the species and that, uh, you know, this has resulted in, you know, a slow evolution into a new form of, of uh, you know, primate that eventually became us. Is there anything in this case with the cone heads or the elongated skulls, as some call them as well, uh, that they fit in in some way uh, in, in that bracket that they're partly partially responsible for making us uh, humans, more human, if you know what I mean, Lloyd. Well, I, I would argue very strenuously that the, the, what we've been told about the Neanderthal is just simply not true, that this thing about hybridization and, and inbreeding and all that, producing the 4% uh, of our genome that is, that is Neanderthal, that 4% is very specifically located in certain areas and it kind of clusters in certain areas and that happens to be in our immune system. Now I am of the opinion and, and others feel differently but I am of the opinion that humans 
were genetically engineered to be on this planet. And I think our, our genome shows very clearly in certain aspects of it the fusion of our second and third chromosomes in a way that's impossible in nature. The inversion of nine, uh, uh, the big inversions of, of uh, chromosomes in, in nine other chromosomes, that these things all show genetic engineering. To me, one of the clearest examples of genetic engineering is that if you're going to build a new, a new sentient being to live on this planet, one of the first things you want to do is find something that's already here that has a lot of, of genetic resistance to the pathogens on the planet and put some of that resistance into the new being. And lo and behold, that's where the dominant aspect of what the Neanderthal, you know, what people have put into, what people have found are in humans relative to the Neanderthals happens to sit mostly in our immune system, our, our genes that impact, heavily impact our immune system. So to me, it's just a big flashing red neon sign that adds to the idea of humans being genetic, genetically engineered and all this business about um, it coming from sexual interaction and all that. It, it's too precise. It just, it just didn't happen. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting take on it. Uh, there are so many things that makes us very different from every other animal here. We've, we did a very rec uh, recent program with uh, Danny Vandermini on the Neanderthals, which also actually added some really interesting aspects to the differences. And of course, he's uh, more of an evolution evolutionist, if you will, in this as well. But nonetheless, we're st no matter what perspective we come to this question from, we realize that th there are so many differences uh, between us and the other animals that we are struggling uh, to explain them, Lloyd. We're, we're, we're struggling to, to realize you know, how could we be so radically different? How did it happen so so quickly? And I mean, I'm not throwing anything out the door at this stage because it's 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 one of the biggest mysteries there there is, isn't there? Well, it is, and it's it, to me, it's very clear that we were genetically engineered. We could not conceivably have evolved here from primates because you know the 25 major uh, differences in that I just mentioned in the star child skull is just coincidental that there are 25 major physiological differences between humans and primates. And it starts with things, just things like the hair pattern on our bodies being completely reversed, not notwithstanding the fact that we have much thinner hair than primates, but the, the, the pattern of thickness is reversed. They're thicker on the back and light on the front. We're thick in the front, light on the back. What would nature be thinking to do that? Why would that happen? We have subcutaneous fat under our skin. They don't have. Where did that come from? The only, the only other mammals that have subcutaneous fat like that are the sea mammals. So where did that come from? We have hair that just grows and grows. We have nails that grow and grow. Primates don't have that. Where's the advantage, the adaptive, adaptive advantage of hair that doesn't stop growing and needs to be cut and nails that don't stop growing and need to be cut? It goes on and on. There, there's no way we evolve from primates. In, anybody that studies it at all knows the truth, and and so it's just it's just ridiculous to say that. And yet, that's what we all have to live with and pretend it's very, very much Monty Python, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Everybody there on the other side in the mainstream, they know what I'm saying is true because if I know it, they know it because I got it from their studies. So it's it's just they're going to try to pretend to keep this fantasy going that we evolved from from primates and that we weren't genetically engineered and put here because they they just don't have another way to deal with that and they don't want to have the turmoil that's going to be created when that happens and it will happen what do you make of this uh, Brian I don't know if you go this uh, I guess deep into the evolutionary uh, processes when you when you're looking into these ancient cultures and such but any additions to this any thoughts on, on these ideas well definitely actually my uh, my university degree is in biology I got an honors degree from the University of Victoria and it was all evolution and I remember um, that when I asked one of my lab teachers, well, you know, evolution is actually still a theory, so what happens if, uh, if I don't 100% believe in it? And she said, very directly, you will not have a future in this field. 
So um, along, also, I've, I've just been reading one of, of uh, Lloyd's books, and all of Lloyd's books are excellent. But what he points out are, you know, are the facts that evolutionary biology is still a theory, and um, wherever gaps occur, such as the so-called missing links, etc., um, you know, they try to fill the gaps because what you know what they're trying to do is they have a, a very specific box of information and a box of parameters that they insist is the history of humanity. And so um, they basically try to have an answer for any, like any question, but they don't have necessarily logical answers. So I'm very, very much um, in Lloyd's camp with that. I think there's something very, very different about us um, as compared to any other life form on this planet. We are so radically different in the way that we think and the way that we act. Um, and especially the action part, because I don't think nature would produce a life form that would have the capacity or or want or need uh, or desire to destroy other you know other life forms like it or the planet as its home. So um, I you know uh, I don't have a very specific um, statement about it, but I'm very open to the idea that there was intervention of some kind on a genetic level to us in the distant past and that's why anomalies such as the star child and the elongated skulls are very important to our understanding of who we are and who we're not. Is there anything of this uh, in, in your uh, view Brian that could be, ex can we explain this with some kind of uh, environmental change or circumstantial change you know like uh, you know Danny Vandermeen who talks about the Neanderthal predation theory argues that you know we've been so Im immensely uh, you, you know hunted this has basically been a, a traumatic event for you know for us in the past as, as humans that it's been a kind of a, a forceful I mean I guess we could call it it's an environmental change that happens that basically triggers uh, rapid evolution within the species that was hunted so something just you know snapped and happened or is the morphogenetic field or other explanations to this and does any of that make sense to you Brian? Actually it does very much so I think that um, our planet has undergone many many different environmental changes um, over the course of our existence and so being you know intelligent uh, beings we have been able to adapt very well to uh, dramatic um, shifts such as the end of, of the ice age which was very you know, very, very dramatic, you know, the raising of sea level very rapidly, um, global environmental changes that have happened, etc. And uh, what's intriguing about the elongated skulls, for example, is that in general, they, they did exist around the world and most commonly about a thousand years ago, or I'm sorry, two thousand years ago. And in general, they were the royal class. They were the um, elite. And so... Um, in the case of the Paracas and other cultures, they were, I think, exterminated by, um, you know, more human-like um, cultures. Um, so they, they seem to be always this, this ruling group uh, that not only looked different but acted different and were the victims of, um, of other cultural people who um, uh, both exterminated and also blended with them. Interesting. Well, I want to ask you a little bit more about that later, but switch over to, to you, Lloyd. Do you know what the time frame is of the of the changes that, uh, that that are said to take place? Basically, when we you know become modern humans, there's something that happens here in the, the you know the missing link and everything else, of course. But how quickly does that change happen? Do we know that? The timing for it was essentially overnight because the Neanderthals start in the range of 400,000, maybe 300,000 years ago, for sure in the range of 300,000. And they, they are sort of by themselves for about 100,000. And then around 200,000 years ago, you have the beginnings of, of what are clearly us. And then you, that moves forward through Cro-Magnons. And what you have in, in that changeover is an absolute... 180 degree change in every physical aspect of the the heads of Neanderthals and the bodies of Neanderthals versus the the skulls and the bodies of Cro-Magnons. It's just simply night and day. It is it is huge protruding um, brow ridges, 
over big round night vision capable eyes. You have foreheads that slope back with ne the Neanderthals. You have big wide splayed noses on their face. You have the mouths that stick off the face in the prognathus ape-like fashion. You have no chin. Again, all this is ape-like. You have the short squatty neck. You have, you have nothing but in Neanderthals an up upright ape. That's really, they have eight bodies with the, with the big, thick ape bones. And then comes the Cro-Magnons, and you have a complete change. You have brow ridges that are very much reduced. You have eye sockets that are very much reduced and, and changed in shape. You have foreheads that go straight up. The Neanderthals, that lump they have in the back of their skull called the occipital bun, that goes away. The noses stick off the face. The mouths go back, flatten up against the face. The chin goes out. You have a chin now. You have a longer neck. You have thinner, lighter bones. In every way, you have something completely different. And, and what Brian said earlier about the missing link, that is the missing link. What goes between Neanderthal and Cro-Magnons? Yeah. They could see it back then that they're there was a problem. There had to be something in between because you can't go from what a Neanderthal is to what a Cro-Magnon is in no time. There had to be something else out there in the world evolving for the evolutionary theory to work in terms of humans. And they've been looking for that missing link for 150 some odd years. And no, you know, it's just nowhere near. It isn't going to happen. It's not there. It never was there. We were, we were created here. The Cro-Magnons were created here. And we just appear. And so there's, to me, there's nothing to do between us. There's no relation between us and Neanderthals at all because Neanderthals, I think, are, are ongoing hominoids, hominoids being what we know today as Bigfoot, the abominable snowman, all that. But there are multiple kinds of those living all around the world, every continent except Antarctica. They've been living here for at least 20 million years, all the way through the Miocene, all the way down, all the way through. And everything that we are told is a pre-human, and that goes back to the uh, Australopithecines, um, you know, Lucy like that, and then you have the early homos, homo habilis, homo erectus, all of that. Every one of those is changing and basically modifying and growing or shrinking, but they're still the same. They have the huge brow ridges, the big brown night vision eyes. They have the sloping foreheads. They have all of the look of the Neanderthal. All of the look. There's no change up through the Neanderthal. And then suddenly, boom, overnight, you have the Cro-Magnons. Something happened, and it is an evolution. So the way the, the, the Bigfoot looks, that, that the classic images, uh, depictions that we've seen, uh, that's pretty much how the Neanderthals looked, do you think? Shrink them down. Yeah, it's all you got to do, Henry. Just shrink down the, the classic Bigfoot Sasquatch look and shrink it down to the size of the Neanderthals. And there is a there is a group of those. They're called the Almas um, um, in and dominate in Russia, and they're called generically Almas, but you are, are captars. You but but every part of the world that has their own version of it has a name for it. And those are the man quote man sized ones, the ones at five to seven feet tall, somewhere in there. Not the Sasquatch Bigfoot kind. Those are you know seven to ten feet tall. Those are the big ones, the giants, but there are a man-sized kind. There are pygmy-sized kinds, small kinds, the, the hobbits of Indonesia. These things live on half of the earth. We think we dominate the whole earth, that we just, we're everywhere. There's just no place we don't know everything about. That is absolutely not true. Half of the arable land of the earth has never once, never once been foot surveyed. Half of the arable land. Take off the ice caps. Take out the deserts. Arable land. Half of that never, never once examined on foot. And we do our surveying now from satellites. It's yeah. never going to be because you can't get in there. It's too hard. It's too thick. It's too dense. <laughs> Look sometimes out of a plane when you're flying over huge swaths of the earth. We may cut a road through there. 
some isolated individual may live there but we don't we don't cluster there we don't we don't make our civilization there and every one of those people that are living out on the edges of those those areas that I'm talking about they all accept that these creatures are out there hmm. it's half their world and people don't understand that people have a very very bad understanding of how what our role is what our place is here we live in the nice open comfortable areas we do not live in those deep dense montane forests where they live in the swamps and the jungles and in the hard to live areas we live in parts of those we cut roads through them but we don't we don't spread out into them and just take them over we clear cut forests we don't live in them we clear cut them we take them down because we can't we we you can't put a walmart and you can't have a walmart in the middle of the forest <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't understand why people have such a hard time to to realize that there just might be another species out there that just hasn't you know gone extinct yet. I mean, uh, looking back to creatures like the Gigantopith Gigantopithecus, right? Uh, I mean, unbelievable. These 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 guys were up to ten feet, uh, weighing up to you know twelve hundred pounds or five hundred forty kilos. It, it, I mean, these are huge. Massive those, those monsters. Are, you know. Skeletons, that's just a skeleton. Uh, the ones that have been found, and they've been found in Asia and China, the ones that have been found, they're just skeletons of of large Sasquatch, Bigfoot-type creatures. All pre-humans, all pre-humans are the skeletons of hominoids, of Bigfoot-type creatures. And all this business about when you see them recreated by the mainstream in books and in dioramas at museums and all that, they have these really, really butt ugly faces because they have the skulls and they can see how ugly they are and how ape like they are. So they have these ape like butt ugly faces and they put bodies on them like mine or yours. When there's just absolutely, if you look at the bones, there's no realistic reason to make them look that way except it's part of the propaganda of the mainstream to make us all believe that what they're saying about that we evolved from from primates is true it isn't true never has been true and like I said if I know it they know it because I get this information from their reports and really anybody anybody that's involved in it can see it but it's like Brian said it's it's very much if you step out of line if you if you go with the truth you can't work in this field if you can't just pretend if you can't wink wink nudge nudge it if you can't join Monty Python with us on this we don't have a place for you in this in this field and that is the truth Brian's right on the money with that hmm. why is that Brian do you think well it's it's just it's simply true in so many um, you know I'd call them belief systems I mean science is a um, is supposed to be um, objective, etc. But when you do, when you have a group of people involved in a specific pursuit, and that is what they do for a living, then anything that comes out from the left or the right hand side that not necessarily attacks it, but just questions it, then there's a, a, a basic defense mechanism. You find the same thing in terms of history. You know, I'm in Cusco, Peru, and uh, I found a lot of information <clears throat> about the fact that much of Cusco, especially the megalithic buildings, were not built by the Inca. They're much older. But if you present that information to archaeologists or anthropologists who study the Inca, they, they will uh, definitively reject you because it doesn't fit their nice little um, their nice little story of history. Yeah. And the same thing, of, same thing, of course, in Egypt. You know, what I saw in Egypt was just incredibly mind-boggling. I saw beautiful temples and amazing things that the dynastic Egyptians of course had made and the you know the Greco-Roman period etc but then you have the uh, Giza Plateau with the massive pyramids and they don't fit into the same picture right. in any way shape or form. I was, the great thing was that I was able to see that firsthand myself and it's like the the Giza Plateau does not fit in with the history of the dynastic Egyptians. Um, so, But th there again you have another example of where it's like everything has to fit into the um, e Egyptologist's 
timeline. So if these giant triangular buildings are there, then they have to fit in because there was nothing, there was no culture before, um, you know, before the, what we think of as the dynastic Egyptians. So biology and evolution are the same thing. And it's true in many other fields as well. If you don't go with what the PhDs, etc., say, you're not allowed a voice. And that's where Red Ice, you know, Red Ice Creations is wonderful because you allow us to have a voice. That's right. We need to talk about these things because there's uh, just so much to it, so much to it that, uh, you know, just as Lloyd says, it's, uh, it's, he's looking at the same material, just, uh, you know, from his point of view, drawing a completely different conclusion. Uh, but, but I think you're both guys are right that they, they're actually knowingly doing this. And I think the reasons are, well, they go far and wide. It's political at this stage. It goes, you know, way deeper than we can even expect, uh, you know, uh, estimate. I think it's, it has to do again with the, just that basic question of, of our origins that there is a for some reason it's a sensitive area and and it's not to be talked about it just we come out of the sludge uh, don't worry about it that's it kind of thing but uh brian the, the elongated skulls the, would would you call them another are they another race or are they another uh, primate i mean where do we put them are they simply regular humans with regular human bodies but just with these elongated strange skulls how would you explain it well, again, as, as what Lloyd and I uh, were saying earlier, it was a global phenomenon and most common about 2,000 years ago. Um, and David Hatcher Childress and I wrote a book about it because we, you know, we basically wanted to do a survey globally of it. And um, in general, you know, the high, high percentage of what we find in terms of cone heads or other altered shaped skulls of, of uh, humanity from the past, most of it is from head binding or or the shaping of um, of the skull from a very early age, usually by a royal class of people. But the intriguing thing is that when you look at at all of these different cultures, there are three basic common things or common themes. One is that it's thought that it made the children more intelligent. Number two, it was thought to be a beautiful thing. And number three, that is what the ancestors looked like. So the question is, who were these ancestors? Um, so what I'm looking at now in Paracas and around Cusco and other parts of South America that I'm able to access is um, examples of skulls that, don't, that have specific characteristics which are not common traits in modern humanity or in... Uh, typical skulls of the history of Peru or Bolivia or other places. And that's what I'm able to find. And that's why it'll be wonderful to have Lloyd here in August, because since he's been looking at this for such a long period of time, he'll be able to um, find a lot of these different features. And that's why we want to make a documentary, because a documentary has never been done properly about the elongated skulls. Well, indeed, there, there's a lot to that. I uh, want to ask you guys a little bit about this. But uh, first of all, why do you think that the Paracas culture were exterminated? Were they, were they hunted pretty much like, uh, like we've seen in other cases with other? Well, we have this scenario of, of different uh, you know, races and species being pretty much eradicated in history. Just, they just disappear flat out all of a sudden. They're, they're gone overnight, just as Lloyd explained that some of them show up overnight pretty much. Well, the, actually, the intriguing thing I've been, you know, I've, I've been living in Paracas for two years and, and, uh, seven days a week I've been studying these. And thanks to, uh, <clears throat> Senior Juan Navarro, who's the expert of the, of the area. And what we can see, and through, uh, limited genetic studies that have been done in the past, is that the Paracas people who disappeared more or less 2,000 years ago, they were not genetically related to people of the highlands of Peru. And it's been generally believed that the culture, the coastal people came from the highlands, but that isn't, uh, isn't the case. And that's based on a German study made three, about uh, three years ago. But what happened was that the Paracas was a dominant culture on, on the coast of Peru, south of Lima. And then this little group south of them called the Nazca, they suddenly began to develop as quite a powerful group of people, and they moved northward into the Paracas area. And in the archaeological record, elongated skulls disappear from the archaeological record about 2,000 years ago. And that is when the Nazca rise in prominence 
Um, the Nazca did not have elongated skulls or, or practice cranial deformation. So it's my belief that the, the Nazca moved north into Paracas territory, uh, destroyed the nobility, took over the land, absorbed their culture and their arts, and then became the dominant culture of the area for about 500 years. Interesting. Now, let's talk a little bit more here than about the the tour that you guys are, are, are doing. Uh, Lloyd, I heard uh, earlier here from Brian that you'd been uh, down there once uh, once before with Sitchin, right? Right. Uh, when I went on Sitchin's first three, on Zechariah Sitchin's first three tours when he did the, when he started them back in the early 90s. And in 94, his first one was to Egypt, his second one was to Peru, his third one was back to Egypt, but, but other places as well, uh, to Lebanon and, and Israel. So um, I, I went on those first three, and the one to Peru uh, I, that I went on, what amazes me is that the 12 days that we spent down there, only to Peru, not to Bolivia, just to Peru, the, very much what, what Brian has set up, Cost the same, uh, three thousand dollars, three thousand American dollars, the same as Brian has been able to arrange for it to cost now. And I, I tell everybody that has to be because he lives down there and he has a Peruvian wife and he knows how to cut deals. Because um, Sitchin and the people that were running his tours apparently, you know, didn't know didn't know those tricks. But but the same price that I paid then is what people pay now for the same uh, twelve day tour to all the great bucket list uh, places that there are to, to see in Peru, the big ones, of course, Machu Picchu, I'm sure Brian uh, probably mentioned this, Machu Picchu and Nazca and Saxwaman and Oyente Tambo and the uh, Inca Stones, the Plains of Nazca, if I mention that, Candelabra, the Andes, you know, those are just fabulous places, all of them. And I, I considered it one of the great, great experiences of my life and still do. And I'm so excited to be going back as a co-leader of a tour 20 years later, basically. Uh, it's, it's extremely exciting for me. Very good. And what are, what are some of the uh, things that you guys will be focusing on? You'll be traveling around to different uh, uh, areas or will you be kind of in one location? What's, what's going to happen? Oh, no, we'll, you know, I, we'll be going to all the major spots which require a bit of travel through Peru to do. Um, that's usually done on, on very nice uh, air conditioned bathroom in the bus kind of thing where the people who go on the tours are, are kept very comfortable the whole way. And, uh, and you, you go to the higher altitude places, you are able to access oxygen as you need it. So there's no, when I went, there was altitude sickness to deal with. We don't, you don't have that anymore. They've, they've learned how to take care of that apparently. So um, it's all good. And I, I feel like those things, um, seeing the sights are one thing, but then there's going to be also a focus on the, on the, uh, the elongated skulls, the cone heads uh, in the museums, and, and some uh, other things I'm sure that we didn't see in 94 that someone like Brian will know about being, a, you know, more or less a, a, a transplanted native there. And uh, I expect it to be even richer in, in, um, in tone and depth than was the Sitchin tour. So for whoever comes on it with us, uh, they're going to have, I think, the experience of a lifetime. I mean, there are very few times when you can say, well, this is, you know, this is the trip of a lifetime. This really is a trip of a lifetime for the average person. And then on top of that, they're going to be um, filming it for a documentary. So you, if you want to come and be a part of that, you leave something behind for your children, your grandchildren, and for posterity. So it's a very, very cool thing to be a part of. It really is. Very good. Brian, you guys are going to go for about, uh, well, 16 days, I think, you're reading through on the website. Uh, tell us about some of the places you'll, you'll visit then. Well, we're actually covering uh, basically all of the enigmatic sites of Peru and Bolivia. So when you think of the Nazca Lines as being mysterious, we're going there because there is a direct connection between the elongated skulls and the Nazca area. We're going to the Cusco area uh, where you have megalithic structures, that uh, stupefy modern engineers and stonemasons and geologists. And again, there's a connection with the elongated skulls. We're, of course, also going to Machu Picchu. 
uh, and other sites in the Cusco area. And then as an extension for four days, we're going to Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. And they, again, are incredibly enigmatic. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to when they were made and who made them. But once again, when archaeological digs are done at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, behold, elongated skulls appear. So this, uh, this is the first tour that, uh, that I've done which focuses more on the elongated skulls than the megalithic structures. But what, what Lloyd and I will be doing is we'll be showing the relationship between the megalithic structures, these mysterious elongated skull people, and also the sites on the coast such as the Nazca Lines and figures, etc., which again are related to an ancient race of uh, beings or people who had elongated skulls. Yeah, these tourists are a lot of fun, a fantastic experience for the folks who gets to go on these. I, I've heard, uh, you know, back from a lot of people who, who has traveled around both, you know, to Egypt and some of your previous as well, Brian, that you've done, uh, you know, around. And it's it's a tremendous experience, of course. This one is called Lloyd Pie Elongated Skulls and Megalithic Wonders of Peru and Bolivia Tour with Brian Forrester. It's from uh, the August 5th to the 7th. Uh, 2013. Why don't we give out some websites, guys, so, so folks where to go, know where to go to uh, check out the tour in a little bit more detail. Sure. Uh, my website is www.hiddenincatours.com. And then we have uh, Gare, of course, who's setting up some of these and helping us to uh, arrange or helping you guys to arrange all this. There's more information at infinite-connections.co.uk. Uh, as well, there's more details about the upcoming tour right there. Uh, Lloyd, let's uh, give out your website address as well, so people can know more about your work on the Star well, Child Skull my, and everything. I, mine would be www.starchildproject.com, starchildproject.com, all one word, and just my name, uh, Lloyd Pye, L L O I D P Y E dot com. Well, too. Uh, study very close up and literally hands on so that's why it's wonderful that Lloyd will be able to come down to Peru in August and and uh, he'll get a, an opportunity also to look at these very much um, he'll be able to handle them etc and because he has great knowledge of human anatomy uh, human origins, um, the primates, etc. his input will be very important for the study of the elongated skulls of Peru. Indeed so a lot of this has to do with human origins. I mean, that's that's one of the biggest uh, uh, questions that we're that we're faced with. Obviously, the, the differences of the human being and where we uh, come from and everything else. Is there anything with these different skulls that can actually give us some clues about this, uh, Lloyd? Elongated or the star child? Yeah, I think I think very much so, and that's one of the one of the th things we're trying to do with the, the DNA research on both. It's clear to me that the coneheads are not entirely human. Some aspect of them, some part of them, is human-like. It's very fair to say that the conehead skulls are human-like, whereas the star child is not human-like. There's no single part of the star child that you can look at, the star child skull, and find an exact corollary on a human skull. Every single thing that you can name as a major, the tw there are 25 major differences and several minor differences between the star child and a human, and there's not a single corollary. Whereas with the coneheads, you do have corollaries. You also have radical differences. So those radical differences, to me, indicate that the, the coneheads will prove to be not entirely human, and their DNA, I think, will prove that as well. So what, what we'll be looking at is a, a culture that was on the earth and, and widespread all over the place at one point that wasn't us, that wasn't entirely us. Who were they? What were they about? What were they doing? And that will open up when we get it established, when we, as Brian was saying, science is very unwilling to deal with these kinds of things because it means changing so much of their fundamental belief set and when they are right today we're doing another round table we have uh, well eventually we'll have three guests with us joining us here but right now we're going to kick things off with uh, two who's done uh, of course research on uh, lost races human origins uh, dna and the uh, mysterious past of uh, where the human being is coming from we have lloyd pie and brian forster with us 
uh, is going to join us here in the first segment, and, and then we have Jerry Willis that's going to join us in the second uh, as well. Well, first of all, we can say welcome back to Lloyd Pye. Uh, thanks for coming on. It was a while ago now, or maybe a year ago, maybe a little bit more, but nonetheless, it's uh, good to have you back, Lloyd. So thanks for coming on. Thank you, and it is good to be back, and it's probably been at least a year, I would imagine. So, yes, happy to be here. I think so. Time does fly indeed. And uh, then we have Brian Forrester with us. Uh, not too long ago, we talked, of course, about uh, the recent Egypt tour you guys did. I, I heard things turned out great with a lot of uh, new experiences, new insights, and some uh, new friends as well. So good to have you back so soon, Brian. Oh, thank you very much, Henrik. So why don't we just begin to you know, talk a little bit about you guys' collaboration work here. I mean, you both have been interested in... Uh, anomalous skulls, pretty much. Elongated skulls. Uh, we have the star child skull uh, from Lloyd Pye and everything else. Um, Lloyd, maybe you can just describe a little bit where you guys' work meet and how long you've been working together, kind of behind the scenes, uh, so I hear anyway. Well, it's been it's been probably, what, two years, I would imagine, Brian, at least that. Maybe yeah. three. Um, maybe three, I don't know, somewhere in there. And when I, real, when I personally have always been interested in the Coneheads, and I've been saying in lectures for probably close to 15 years now that the Coneheads are as important in their own way as the Star Child Skull. Even though the Star Child Skull is one of a kind so far, and the Coneheads are in the hundreds, that doesn't mean that they aren't in very, very important in their own way. And I kept saying, somebody needs to do something with those things. They, as far as I knew, they had not even been... Um, carbon carbon dated, uh, much less have their you know their DNA analyzed in any way. So I kept harping about that, and I kept saying if if I ever got any money from the Star Child, that was the next thing I was going to turn my attention to. And then I heard about Brian being down there, and I I we connected, and I started saying you know you ought to be, become the conehead guy, <laughs> you know. It, it, no, there's nobody there to fill that role right now. It could be you. It should be you. And so um, I, he acted on that, and, and, you know, he's become the Conehead guy. So, not, I mean, not that that's the only thing that he does, but I, I think it was uh, he, he filled a, a role that was very much needed in the field of alternative knowledge, and I think he's done a really good job with it. Very good. So what, what's, what is the relationship between the two uh Brian, how much similarities are we talking about? Have you seen uh, the, the Star Child Skull as well? No, but I'm, actually I'm hoping that uh, Lloyd will at least bring a, a, a copy of the, or the Star Child with him when he comes in August. But uh, I think the, the parallel between the two is the fact that mainstream science has a tendency not to want to look at either. And so Lloyd has been very, um, you know, he's been working very hard with uh, the one specimen that he does have, and I've been very fortunate with the multiple examples of the elongated skulls of Peru and Bolivia that I've been able to. 